Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Today we're going to tackle a subject that has been taught and many times taught 100% correctly, but it was perceived wrong. It was perceived wrong. And um, I think sometimes we hear something, but then what we think we hear isn't exactly what we heard, and we act on the false information, which puts us in the wrong place and doesn't give us the result that we think we should have. You know, many people are afraid of money because of that scripture verse that says money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says the love of money is the root of all evil. And you don't have to have money to love it. And so I want to tackle something today that uh, has been, as I say, many times over the years taught correctly but perceived wrong. And uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Phil, would you come up here right now? And the microphone, where did it go? Is it over here? The one that says speaker on it? That's it? Okay, turn it on. We did that. Come with me. Now, Phil, I want you to take the microphone. Okay. I want you to stand right here and face the wall. Okay. And I know that this is going to work because I saw it in a convention one time and it worked. Okay. Now, Phil, here's, we're, we're going to play a little role playing here. I am, if you can just picture this, I am a, a, a guy from the islands and I've never been in temperature below 85 degrees. And somehow I'm invited here to Missouri. And I'm here in Missouri, and I've got all my clothes with me that I had back on the island. You know, my khakis and my flip-flops and my tank top. You guys can all picture that, right? And uh, so... I get back here and we're in the middle of a blizzard and you're off at your office and I'm at your house. And while I'm at your house, it's cold. And I don't know what to do because I don't have any warm clothes. So I call you up on your cell phone. I, I know how to, everybody knows how to operate a cell phone. I call you up on your cell phone and you're at the office and I tell you that I'm freezing. And you say to me, well, just put on a coat. Well, I'm from the island. I've never seen a coat before. Nobody on our island needed a coat. We didn't hardly even need shirts. So, Phil, I want you to explain to me, there's, you have a coat at the house, and it's laying over across the, the couch. Now, you're going to explain to me how to put on a coat. You're, first of all, Phil, I'm cold. What do I do? You need to cover up with a coat. Probably. I need to cover up with a coat. Well, what's a coat? It is a large garment that you would put over your shirt that you ex have on or your tank top. Where is it? Uh, probably in your closet. Do you have a coat? Let's establish that, number one. Okay, you, so I, I, found, I found the coat. Okay, that's step number okay, one. Okay, what do I do with it? Just like putting on your shirt, you want to make sure on the inside of the coat, the tag is at the back, which, which you would put on your back. Okay, I, I think I found that. Okay, and then the opening in the front would either have a zipper with like teeth on it and a okay. tab or buttons. Buttons? You, okay, I've got the buttons. Okay, you want to put that on the front. You make sure when you put it on, it's on the front side, on your, on your stomach. Okay. Put it and on then the stomach. long, well, then the long things are called your sleeves. So you would want to put each arm. What, what, are, the, what, what are they called? Sleeves. Sleeves. Okay, yes. I, I think I found that. 
okay? So you want to put your sleeve, like start with your right arm. You put your right arm in the sleeve. Okay. You would take it and put it over your back and then put your left arm into your other sleeve. Pull it up wait, over... Wait, wait just a minute. I can't... Excuse okay, me. I found it. Pull it up over your shoulders. Okay. And either take the zipper and you make sure the tab is all the way at the bottom. You put the one slot into that tab and you would... Wait pull a minute. I think okay. I got a problem here. Okay. I can't find the tab. Okay. Okay, look. Do you have the you code? You turn around now. Okay. Okay. Where, where's that? Where's that tab? It's called. You have a cell phone. Is it a smartphone? <laughs> Look up how to put on a coat. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Now, I think what you can see, he was giving correct directions. Everything he said was right, but not having the knowledge of or ever seeing a coat. Or, or knowing anything about how to dress warm in cold weather, I took what he said, which was correct, I interpreted it all wrong, and I just got myself in a mess. And if it was truly in that situation, I probably would have froze. Why? Because I didn't understand correctly what was being spoken. Now, I see this happening with faith. Faith can be taught. The Bible talks about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 You can't please God without faith. And we know that Jesus said one time, your faith has made you well. And the Bible tells us in Romans, anything that's not of faith is sin. And Ephesians 2.8 tells us, for grace we have been saved through faith. So faith is a real big deal. But when faith has been taught, it has been taught many times, most of the time, correctly. But it's perceived wrong, and people have stepped off into sometimes presumption or foolishness, based on what they think they heard. Now, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the evidence of things that you don't see. Now, First Corinthians 2.14, let's start here. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So I want to take something this morning and share with you where faith was taught to man by God. And we're going to start there. Now, Abraham, we call him the father of our faith. Abraham, the father of our faith. I want to relate to you an encounter, scripturally, between God and Abraham. Now, this happened when Abraham was 99 years old. Genesis 17, 3. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And that means the father of many, the father of nations. It's also translated the father of a multitude. And then God goes on to say, for I have made you a father of many nations. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. 
Now, was Abraham, whose name means the father of many nations, was he the father of many nations when God said that? No, he wasn't. He was the father of basically nothing. But God said, this will come to pass. And then he made a very interesting statement. He said, I have made you. That's past tense. I have made you the father of many nations. And then he changed his name. He changed Abraham, Abram's name to Abraham so that every time somebody said Abraham, they were saying, you're the father of many nations. Was he the father of many nations in, in the physical? No, he was not. But God was calling that into existence. Now, let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, now look what it says here in verse 17, Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who, whom he believed. God, now it's getting ready to describe God here. God who gives life to the dead. That's what God does. You want to know who God is? God gives life to the dead. And, listen to this, He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now that is a basic principle of faith. God said, I have made you the father of many nations. He said that. I have made you. In other words, he's saying, it's, it's already happened. You are, because I've made you this way. You are the father of many nations. Were there many nations he was the father of at that time? No. But God called the thing that did not exist as though it did exist. And by calling the thing that did not exist as though it did exist, then it did exist. It goes on to say, who, contrary to hope, in verse 18, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now, when we read the New Testament and the testimonies of of what Jesus did, a lot of people don't realize that Jesus operated in faith by calling the things that did not exist as though they did. The things that do not exist, he called them as though they did. Now, we can go all the way back into Genesis and we can see where God Almighty, God the Father, stepped into darkness. There was total darkness. And he says, light be, light is, light, light. But it wasn't. When he said it, it wasn't. But he, he said what he wanted to see instead of what he did see. He was in darkness. The Bible says that while in darkness, he said, light is, light be. Let there be light is the way it's translated in our scripture. So, we as believers, we walk by faith and not by sight. That's scriptural. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. That means we say what God says. We believe God. We call those things that do not exist as though they do and then they will. Look at this. Luke 13.10 Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, 
he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Hallelujah. He said, you are loosed from your infirmity. Kimmy, come up here for just a moment, please. world-famous nurse practitioner you are. All right. So, you're all bowed over. So kind of bend yourself over. Okay, you're all bowed over. Okay. And Jesus said, come here. You're doing good. You, have you ever thought about taking a acting? No. Good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> stay a nurse practitioner. Okay, okay. So you're still all hunkered over. Okay. And Jesus said to her, now you, you're not healed until I tell you. <laughs> Jesus said to her, woman, you are loosed of your infirmity. She wasn't. But he said she was. What was he doing? He was calling those things that be not as though they are. After he proclaimed that she was loosed from her infirmity, then he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. Thank you. So, is that all the applause she gets for that? <laughs> so, see, we, we don't think about this sometimes. But Jesus proclaimed she was loosed from her infirmity when she was not. He was calling that thing that was not as though it was. And then, after that, then he laid hands on her and she was healed. And we can find that in so many of these stories of Jesus. How about this? Luke 17.11 now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there, he, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood, stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Then he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. Now, here's an interesting thought. In that day, in that culture, in that time, you did not show yourself to the priest unless you were healed. You had, if you were a leper and you were healed, you had to go and get your healing certified by the priest. And Jesus looked at these lepers, who were lepers, there were ten of them, and they said, have mercy. And Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. In other words, he was saying, you're healed. He called them healed. But they were still lepers. And how do I know that they were still lepers? Because it says... And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. So when they started, they weren't. But as they went to the priest, as they traveled to get to the priest, they were healed. So when Jesus made the proclamation, go show yourself to the priest, he was basically saying, you're healed. Go show yourself to the priest. But they weren't. He called that thing that be not as though it was. And then as they were obedient to what he said, they were. Boy, this is good. See, faith is positive. Denial, now I've told you this many, many times, and you should know this. Faith is believing God. Denial is a river in Egypt. There is no power in denial. There's power in faith, but there's no power in denial. And I want to show you where sometimes people get mixed up on this. And we, we really need to 
understand this. If you're hurting, and someone walks up to you and says, are you hurting? And you say, no, I am not hurting. I have no pain. That's not faith. That's a lie. You just lied to them. Now you say, wait a minute. That, that wasn't a lie. I was, I was standing in my, my confession. Your confession would be, I'm feeling pain. I'm feeling it. But I don't go by the way I feel. I go by what God says. By the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. See, now people can understand that. But if you, if you fall down and break your arm and the bone's sticking out, blood running everywhere and the bone's sticking out, and somebody says, did you break your arm? You go, no. No. My arm's not broken. That's denial. Faith is, my arm is healed by the stripes of Jesus. Now, faith doesn't mean you don't go to the doctor. I would recommend if you fall down and break your arm and the bone's sticking out and you're bleeding all over the place, you need to go across the street to the hospital and have them do what they do. And they'll do what they do. But you have faith that they're going to do what they do right. And you have faith that God is healing you supernaturally along with the process. But you don't deny that you fell down. You don't stand there and say, I didn't fall down. No, we need to understand the difference between faith and denial. Now listen. Faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. Denial is calling those things that are as though they are not. And they sound similar, but they're not the same. Well, Brother Allison, I don't understand all that faith stuff. To me, that's confusing. I just believe in calling things the way I see them. That's what I do. I just call things the way I see them. Well, sometimes that's kind of dumb. And let's say, for example, uh, who has a dog? Anybody? You have a dog. What's your dog's name? Maisie? Macy. Like the department store? Okay, Macy. All right. So you go, you go to the back door of your house and Macy's running around out there and you want Macy to come to you. What do you do? Here, Macy. Here, Macy. Here. Here, girl. Here, Macy. Now, let me tell you something. Macy's not there. Now, don't, don't you mess up my illustration. <laughs> Macy's not there. But if somebody watched you, what are you doing? You're calling that thing that be not as though it is. You're, you're, you're saying, here, Macy, and you're pointing down, and Macy's not here. Macy's out running around the yard, and you're saying, here, Macy. You're saying what you want, not what you see. If you just call things the way you see them, you'd say, there's Macy. There's Macy over there. There's Macy over there. But Macy's not going to come till you call her. Phil, come up here. Run up here real quick, as quick as you can. Okay, now, just as quick as you can, why did you come up here? Because you asked me to. Okay, <laughs> now, here's the deal. Phil came because I called him. Was he here? No. Phil, here. <laughs> You cannot call things the way you see them. You've, Ephesians 5.1 tells us to imitate God. What's God do? He brings life to the dead. That's what it says. He brings life to the dead. That's good. You know, I was in a church one time. Well, not really, but it's a good story. I was in a church one time and... Uh, a guy died in church. It was back when I was a Baptist pastor. And an uh, ambulance showed up, and they took out half the church before they got the right guy. <laughs> oh, well. 
<laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, all right. Moving right along here. See, you're out there, you're saying, here, Macy, here, Macy. And, and Dallas walks up and says, why are you lying? You lying woman? I was thinking about marrying you, but I don't know now. You lied. You said Macy was here. And Macy's not here. That's a lie. No, that's not a lie. In faith, that's calling those things that be not as though they are. Still love me? Okay. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot have faith for something that's not God's will. And that's something else too. You, you cannot call something that be not as though it is unless God told you that it was to be. Now that takes the wind out of a lot of people's sails because people are claiming things. See, now look, years ago when faith was taught, it really got a bad rap from a lot of people and they gave it names. They called it the, the name it and claim it gospel. You know, the blab it and grab it gospel. The lip it and grip it gospel. I mean, it had all kinds of names. But the reality is, we are supposed to name God's promise and we claim it by calling what we don't have that God has promised, we call it as though we do have it. Now, foolishness does not mean that you ignore going to the doctor. It doesn't mean that you don't pay your bills. See, there was a lot of people who took this over into prosperity, and, and I understand that. And um, I wasn't going to go here, but I think I'm going to mention it for a moment. Only because I think I need to mention it for a moment. Hmm. I'm never going to borrow a penny because the Bible says, Oh, no man anything but love. Well, right there, you owe everybody. You owe everybody love. But... Let's take this in context and you read all the Scripture around it and you're going to find out that we are not to do harm to our brother. And God several times said that we would be a lender. He also said that we wouldn't need to borrow. Why? Because we're the lenders. And uh, that sounds like a bagel, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Um. Hmm. Well, let me just tell you what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 42. Give to him who asks, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. What's that mean? That means that you take somebody who is desperate and they need to borrow something, you don't turn them away. You lend to them. If borrowing is a sin, then lending is helping somebody sin. Now, you've got to keep all this in balance. See, this is, this is where people hear things and they put the code on wrong. You cannot operate in somebody else's faith. There are people and there are times when God will tell you, do not borrow. Do not get yourself into debt. And there is a big difference in the way people borrow. And borrowing means that you take something that belongs to somebody else and you have it for a while, but it still belongs to them and then you give it back. If you, if you get super, super strict on what you think the Word says, 
then you've eliminated yourself from borrowing your neighbor's lawnmower if your lawnmower quits. Or, can I borrow your phone for a minute? No, borrowing is a sin. You cannot use my phone. I mean, are, are you seeing how things can be taken out of context? Okay. Well, I know that what I did there was I opened up an area where you can fall into a rabbit hole and never come back. And that was my way of presenting humor so that you would realize I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Hello? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can see right now I'm going to have to have a series on this probably. Over here on the wall, we have a thermostat. If I walk over to this thermostat, and it says it's 70 degrees in here, and I crank it up to 78 and walk away, is it now 78? No. What did I do? I set that at what I wanted, not what it is. If you just see things the way they are, if you walk in your house and it's 68, you go over and you set your thermostat at 68. Why do you set it at 68? Because I just, I like to set things the way they are. I like to, no. You set things for what you want. You call the Word of God, you call His promise in your life as though it exists. Even though you don't see it, you're walking by faith. You're walking by what he said rather than by what you see. Now, eventually, if I set this at 78, eventually this room will be 78. But I don't have to think about it because I have faith not in the thermostat. I don't have faith in the thermostat. I have faith in all of the electronics and heaters and everything that it's connected to. Are you following me? Now, the thermostat is the goal setter. The furnaces actually do the work. So you cannot have faith in your faith. You have to have your faith in God, and your faith is just the catalyst that activates His power, moves angels, so that you get what He promised. Now, when we paid umpteen thousand dollars for these thermostat, for these furnaces, we were guaranteed that they would work. But I don't go in when it gets cold in here. In order to make it warm, I don't go in and beat on the furnace and say, give me heat, give me heat, I need heat. No, I just simply go to the thermostat and set it for what I want. You don't have to beg God. You're not beggars. You don't have to beg God. You just go and set your faith for what it is that He promised you. Not for just anything, but for what He promised you. And then, then your faith activates the power. Are you following me? Now here's, here's, let's get back to the coat illustration. So let's say I have somebody in here, and they are not familiar with, with heat. Once again, let's say they're from an island. They, they don't even have furnaces on the island. But they're here and it gets cold. And they say, I'm cold. And I say, just a moment, I'll fix that. And they watch me. And I go over to the thermostat and I crank it from the cold temperature. I crank it up into the mid-70s. And in just a little bit, the room starts warming up. And our friend from the island where it's never cold he goes, wow, that is amazing. Well, I'm supposed to go visit some friends of mine in Wisconsin next week. I know what I'm going to do. So he goes down to Lowe's or Home Depot, 
and he buys a thermostat. Puts it in his suitcase. He takes his thermostat with him. He's in his hotel room and it's cold. So he gets out his thermostat and he cranks it up to 78. And he waits and he waits and nothing ever happens. Why? Because he's imitating what I did. Instead of having faith in God, he's got faith in my thermostat. You, you can't have your faith in the mechanism. Your faith has to be in him. Faith is believing God. Faith isn't believing that faith will work. Believing that faith will work is not believing God. Believing God is the ultimate reality, and believing him is called faith. Wow, this is getting good. So, in the bookstore immediately following the service today, we're going to be selling thermostats that you can take with you anywhere and they won't work. See, that's the thermostat is just the goal setter. And unless it's connected to the power, see, and now, setting it when it's not connected is kind of like just being in denial. Now, now follow me. Get a little clearer on this. Let's say you're sick. And your confession is, somebody says, well, how do you feel? You go, I'm not sick. According to the Bible, I'm not sick. What is that? You're, you're denying what does exist. What's the reality? You're sick. You're hurting. That's the reality. But what's the promise? The promise is, by the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. That's like God saying to Abraham, you, I have made you, and here's what you are. You are the father of many nations. Hello, I'm 99 years old and I don't have a kid. What's going on here? I don't have a nation. But... You call the thing that be not as though it is until it is. Okay. Ah. Hmm. Matthew 5.25 Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she learned about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her affliction. Wow. You must believe that you have received before you receive, and then you will receive. Let's take a look at uh, Mark eleven twenty four. Just turn your Bibles over to that. How's that? How many of you have Bibles? All right, that's good. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray. Now I've, I've shared this with you multiple times, but you need to understand this. This ties in. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, in your paper Bibles, it doesn't necessarily show it in the electronics, but it, there, uh, the word them is italicized. And what that means is, is that word is not there in the original language. It was added by the translators so that it would be more easily understood. Translators do that. And so technically it says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have. However, the word 
receive there is translated incorrectly. Some of your Bibles will show it correct. But uh, in the New King James here, it says, believe that you receive. But it should say, believe that you have received. In the Greek, it's past tense. So, believe that you have received and you will have. Well, when you believe you have received it, then you're going to speak like you have received it. But when you say you have received it and you haven't received it, what you're doing is you're calling those things that be not as though they are. You say you have it, when you don't, and then because you say it when you don't, you do. And I know that sounds complicated, but that's faith. Faith, look, faith is believing God so much that if He promised something to you, you act as though you believe as though you've already got it because you trust Him. Okay, now, uh, I know many of you who have been here for a lot of years, you've heard my illustrations over and over and over again. Too bad. I'm going to tell this one again. I had a guy who was talking with me here at the church many, many years ago, and he was really concerned about his taxes, how much money he was going to have to pay. Because he felt like he was going to have to pay a lot of money, and he didn't have a lot of money. So one day I run into him at the store. I forget where it was. I think it was Walmart. It's where most Christians meet. And, uh, but, I, but I ran into him, and I just happened to think about his tax situation. And I said to him, I said, oh, hey, how did it turn out on your taxes? And he said... Oh, pastor, I got back $600. Can you believe it? The IRS gave me $600. And I said to him, I said, well, what did you spend it on? And he kind of got a little taken back, and he said, oh, well, I haven't actually got it in the mail yet, but that's what they said I'm going to get. So what happened is he went to a tax man, filled out all of his tax papers, and come to find out instead of having to pay money, he was going to get $600 back. So they filled out all the papers. He paid the tax man. They folded it up, stuck it in an envelope, and mailed it to the IRS. And as far as he was concerned, he had, he spoke to me in past tense. He said, I got back $600. Well, he didn't get back $600 yet. He, he, it was on the paper. Now, now look. If people can believe the IRS <laughs> and call that thing to be not as though it is, why can't we believe God? If God promised us something, we should, <laughs> we, we should believe that. We should believe that just as much as believing that the government promised us something. You know, who was it, President Ronald Reagan, that said, <laughs> one of the scariest things you'll ever hear somebody say if they knock on your door, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> yeah. So, Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. What's that telling us? What you need exists right now in the realm of the Spirit over there. It exists. God promised it. He has it for you. But what we've got to do is we're in the realm of the physical. We need to somehow reach into the realm of the spiritual and apprehend it and bring it back so that the thing that we see was made out of something that we don't see that's invisible and it's not here 
but we're calling that thing that God promised, we're calling it here because he promised it, even though it's not here. But by doing that, we're putting our faith into the realm of the spirit and we're bringing back into the physical realm the promise of God for you. And what is his promise? That no weapon formed against you will prosper. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. By the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. And we got to get over this business of, well, it doesn't look that way. Or it sure doesn't look like it. Well, quit looking at it. Start believing God instead of believing what you see. Hmm. Now, look, you, remember, you can't just say anything. You know, there's a gentleman out in California. He, he was an usher. Real good-looking guy. Kind of looked like, well, like he was a good-looking guy. <laughs> kind of looked like Phil. And uh, I mean, at, at this church, I, I've been to that church before. I sang in their choir once. Almost got injured because when they sang, they got physical. So, but the ushers all wore white gloves and, and semi-formal tucks. And when they took Loretta in and ushered her in and set her down, I, I didn't know if I was ever going to get her back. I mean, you know, <laughs> good, looking, good looking ushers. All right. Well, there was a lady that went to that church and she was single and she saw one of those ushers. It's a true story. She saw one of those ushers and all of a sudden, the old heart started beating and she knew that was my man. Well, she heard a sermon. Call those things that be not as though they are. God has for you a promise and all you got to do is name it, claim it, you know. And this is why the name it and claim it got, got a bad name. See, name it and claim it is right. But the way people hear it, they're putting the code on wrong. Are you, are you following me? So she saw him and she said, that's my man. And he's going to be my husband. And in the name of Jesus... I claim him for me. No other woman shall have him. He's mine. And, and so she did. She kept claiming. Well, she never really met him. So one day she goes up and she's talking to him. And he mentions something about his wife and kids. And this lady lost it. I mean, she felt God lied to her. And, and really, she got all messed up. And there's a lot of people that kind of fall away. They get messed up because they think God lied to them when in reality God didn't lie to them. No, He only promises what He promised. He, he's not going to promise you somebody else's spouse. He's not going to promise you somebody else's house unless He has a plan where that's the way it's supposed to be. Are you following me? So when, when you call the thing that be not as though it is, make sure that it lines up with God's Word, and that you're being led by the Holy Spirit and not being led by your fleshly desires. The Bible tells us that all the time. Our fleshly desires, they'll mess you up. And sometimes people will take a fleshly desire and they will put a little scripture with it to make it trying to trick God into giving it to them. You, you know what I mean? You, let me tell you something. I know this from experience. You can't con God. I think God knows more about your head than you do. Okay. Colossians 1.16. For by him, which by the way, the Chiefs game today is a late game, so there's no, no concern here. So we can just kind of go on till 3 o'clock, right? For by him, all things... <laughs> that was humor. Loretta tells me sometimes, you know, you, you, ha you need to clarify your humor. Because, I mean, sometimes people actually think, well, never mind, okay. Just read my email for one day, and you'll understand. What I'm doing. Colossians, Angie has a lot to cut out here, doesn't she? <laughs> okay. 
Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Wow. Okay. Mark 11.23, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I gave you that scripture again because you need to understand this. When you you make your faith statement, you've got to believe it. It can't just be words. It can't be just, well, I heard somebody else say it and I wrote it down, so I'm going to say it. It's not just saying. Saying is... Let's put it this way. Saying, in a way, is like a thermostat. And if you, if you don't believe it, it's not hooked to anything. It's just empty words. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. 1 John 5, 4. This is a scripture that I think all Christians need to keep in front of them all the time. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of Him. What you ask must be God's will. And not your will unless your will aligns with His will. Do not name it and claim it in the flesh. Do not call something that is not as though it is unless you know that that's what God has for you. And God may not have for you... Now, there's some things that are universal. Healing, prosperity, but there's individual things that God may have for you that He doesn't have for someone else or that He has for someone else that He doesn't have for you. And that's where discerning of spirits comes in and that's knowing your lane, staying where God has put you. See, and a lot of times people in the ministry get this mixed up. They, they, they feel they're called into the ministry and then they try to uh, imitate their favorite preacher or their favorite missionary or, or whatever. no. You be who God called you to be, doing what God called you to do. Early in my ministry, I tried to have Billy Graham's accent. Really. I mean, when I was a kid, I I thought, I, I, I wanted to say Scripture the way he did. Turn in the Scripture. And I never, I never got it, as you can readily see. I never got his accent. But what I should have been seeking was the same anointing that he had. You see what I mean? Let's all stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. Thank you, Father, for teaching us through your word. In the name of Jesus, amen.